Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from Omdia, a division of Informatech. Today, our topic is modernizing 5G infrastructure security. Our panel will examine the steps that service providers must take to secure their networks in the face of massively increased bandwidth and highly distributed architectures. Our webinar is co-presented by Omdia, Juniper Networks, and their partner, Ericsson. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the Omdia webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. So before we get started, let me just highlight some of the features that are available for you on our webinar. So the console that you're looking at, it is completely customizable. This means you can open, close, move, or even resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console any way you like. Now at the bottom of your console, you're gonna see a number of application widgets. I do wanna mention the resource list widget and this is where you will find additional material about our topic, including the slide deck from today's session, which is downloadable, as well as other valuable information, including a special report authored by analyst Jeff Wilson. You're also going to see a Twitter widget, which means you can tweet directly from within the console. And today we are using the hashtag 5G security. We will also have a live Q&A session directly after our presentation, as always. So please submit your questions or comments at any time throughout the webinar by using that Q&A box that you see on the left side of your screen. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and that the on-demand version will be sent out to you within about 24 hours. And if you experience any te technical issues, just make sure you click on that question mark widget and you will get the answers that you need. So now let me introduce our panel. First leading our discussion is Jeff Wilson. Jeff is research director and advisor in the cybersecurity technology segment at Omdia. Alongside Jeff, we are joined by Albert Liu. Albert is Product Management Director of Service Provider Security and IoT Security Solutions at Juniper Networks. We are also joined by Irene Zhang. Irene is Senior Product Marketing Manager of Service Provider Security Solutions, also at Juniper Networks. And rounding out our panel, we have Anna Kurda. Anna is Strategic Product Manager of RAND Security at Ericsson. So welcome to our panel. It is great to have you with us today. So now let me turn things over to Jeff so we can get started. Jeff? Oh, great. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we just discovered that we have uh, speakers covering eight different time zones here today. I suspect the same is true with the audience. Um, I'll start by saying I hope everybody's safe and uh, keeping themselves busy in this uh, insane time that we're living through. Um, and, uh, fortunately or unfortunately for us, uh, work continues. Um, and 5G is, is going to be some of the critical work that's gonna have to continue to, uh, to keep everybody connected uh, now and in the future. So, um, you know, what we really wanna talk about today is, um, you know, what are the real challenges um, associated with rolling out security for 5G networks. And, and, and as you migrate uh, 4G and LTE uh, into 5G, into kind of an, a new world of architecture, um, you know, what, what's changing? What's different? And what do you need to keep in mind as you, as you roll out 5G? I mean, the first thing we can really start uh, with is to say, um, you know, 5G rollout is really gaining momentum, We're moving towards mass market. Uh, and, and with that is a host of new service types and capabilities. Um, obviously, enhanced mobile broadband, incredible, incredible increases in speed and bandwidth, um, uh, mission-critical communication, so lots of applications with the, the uh, new bandwidth afforded to us by 5G for um, ultra-high reliability, sustainable security, and low latency for, um, you know, for... Uh, uh, critical comms uh, applications, things that we wouldn't have never relied on mobile networks in the past for, um, you know, uh, um, for in, uh, infrastructure and transportation and, and disaster relief and recovery, um, things things that are now possible to use the flexible and scalable 5G networks for massive deployments of IoT, um, you know, and and the sort of coverage and, and density that that is going to imply the need for you know, long battery life, low low data rate optimization, and a host of enterprise services. You know, five uh, prior to 5G, we mostly thought of mobile in terms of 
um, consumer use and emergency backup and not as a real viable form of connectivity for a wide range of enter enterprise services. And that is absolutely going to change. Um, but we've got, you know, hundreds of telcos in over 100 uh, countries who have already invested. Um, 50 telcos in 27 countries have launched 3GPP compliant 5G commercial services. And then we have large scale deployments uh, already in, in a variety of countries. So it's here. I guess is the, is the point. Um, but interestingly, 5G is in an ecosystem of, uh, you know, other technologies, other revolutionary technologies that are all sort of converging at the same time to open up um, a, a range of new opportunities. So obviously 5G provides the connectivity and that connectivity is getting faster um, uh, and more distributed. Um, we combine that with IoT. Um, we suddenly have an opportunity to connect a lot of new types of devices that are generating lots of new types of information that are useful. Um, we combine that with the scale of the cloud and the new architectures that, that are being uh, deployed in the 5G world. And, and then we combine that with, with artificial intelligence um, consuming the data from IoT devices at cloud scale to enable new types of data analysis and information uh, and enabled decisions. Um, there is a, a tremendous opportunity for new types of services. So we're here. It's, it's happening. Uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a range of things that implies uh, mass market availability of devices, subscriber uptake now. Um, there is a uh, 3GPP 5G security standard. It's, it's security is baked in to some degrees. Uh, specs for security are baked in. This drives new capabilities and needs, um, AI to manage the network operations, uh, edge capacity to, uh, to optimize utilization. Um, security is critical from day one, but 3GPP doesn't address all security issues. It's not a switch that you flip uh, uh, to have a secure network. It's a series of choices that you're gonna have to make and deployments that you're gonna have to undertake. Um, this enables new opportunities. Like I said, IoT and mobile broadband it also creates a new pool of devices for hacker to exploit, for hackers to, for attackers to exploit. The attack surface grows, bandwidth grows exponentially. Um, just as industry innovates, uh, so so does the adversaries, and we are handing them a gigantic pool of new capabilities with the rollout of 5G networks, and and this creates a tremendous opportunity for telcos. Um, but it also creates almost unlimited opportunity for attackers to create new threats and exploit 5G users, infrastructure, and services. And this has to be, and you have to keep this in mind with every decision that you make. When the end 5G is years away, uh, but in the meantime, you're managing security for 4G networks, for inter intermediate networks, and for the pockets of 5G that you've already deployed. Um, 5G is interesting because it, um, it introduces a new uh, set of architectures. Um, the, the key characteristics of these are first, the move from a centralized to a distributed architecture, which the attackers will take advantage of. Um, more power at the edge, uh, more intelligence at the edge, more information at the edge means the edge becomes a, a, a target. Um, transition to service-based architecture, leveraging cloud technology in telecom infrastructure. Um, it's a whole new ball of wax from a protection standpoint. Um, uh, folks in the enterprise and in data center and cloud who have already deployed cloud architectures have discovered that it generates new vulnerabilities that they have to be aware of. Uh, and then obviously the increase in bandwidth at the core, at the edge and at the device, 10 to 100 times, it creates uh, massive opportunities for attackers. So security is critical to the 5G value proposition from the beginning for both consumers who are used to serving um, and now enterprises and enterprise applications, possibly even more critical on the enterprise side. So this requires a secure foundation to handle the evolution of threats and security concerns that, uh, that everything that 5G is indicates. There will be new, new contexts and use cases to secure, particularly in the enterprise, in critical infrastructure and defense, government. Um, uh, there will be considerations around cloud solutions that decouple hardware and software and virtualize 
um, the infrastructure. Um, we're certainly going to see massive growth in potentially and definitely unsecure devices. Um, you know, the potential to uh, impact critical business processes, all new security and privacy standards and regulations. These new business contexts create new attack vectors which require a new security and privacy approach. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Anna from Ericsson to talk a little bit more about the problems and challenges associated with 5G and security. Anna? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so let's start uh, to look at the uh, assets, the, the asset that we have to protect. Uh, we can start with the data in transit, and that is all the data that is flowing uh, through the network. We can divide that into three categories. So we have the user data, and that is uh, the, the data which uh, you and I as a subscriber or an industry using the network are sending through the network. So like it can be phone calls, it can be emails, it can be whatever data. Uh, this we have to protect, of course. And then we have the control signaling, also called control plane traffic. Uh, the control plane traffic is the, the traffic that is steering the different nodes and the UEs and so on. And, of course, we don't want to have anyone who manipulates with the steering of the, the network. Then we have the management traffic, and that is, uh, for example, how you configure the different nodes in the network, uh, how you uh, look into performance of the network and these type of things. And here also, uh, it's important that we protect this traffic so no one can go in and uh, manipulate with the um, network nodes in that sense. Then we have data at rest, and that could typically be logs or it could be keys that we are saving or storing in the nodes, and of course, these also have to be protected. And then data in use, is, that is uh, when you are processing the data. Besides this, we also have other assets like the system itself, the nodes, the, the software, and also the uh, frequency spectra. So this has to be considered. But then also, what, what uh, threats do we see? Uh, that's important to think about. So. This is a general slide that shows uh, some examples of attacks. Of course, it's not limited to those, but it's the most common attacks. So we have eavesdropping, for example, denial of service, uh, if someone would be able to manipulate with the software in order to, to put the malware on a, somewhere in the network, for example, man in the middle attack. Uh, someone to pretend, pretending to be a node that it's, uh, it's actually not is a node uh, the, or the legitimate node. And then a physical attack, that someone has physical access to the node. And we try to illustrate this in this diagram here. So it's a simplified way of showing the network. And as you can see here, the radio base stations, uh, we have normally several thousand of those in a network. And of course, if someone have access to those nodes, we need to make sure that it's not easy to access them from an operational point of view. Or for example, we have to protect the traffic that is uh, transported over the network. And here you can see also if someone have access to the transport network or for example, the air interface, the air interface is everywhere and accessible to everyone. So this we have to protect, of course. And then we have the insider attack, which we should not forget about, which is the most difficult maybe to protect against, but there are always means to, to limit uh, such an attack. If we then move a bit forward and see where, what would happen if someone would attack the different components of the network, of course, the radio base stations, they are, as I said, we have several thousands of them in a network normally, and then uh, some of those nodes are very exposed. It can be a uh, street macro base station that is located in the public area somewhere, and of course that node is very exposed. Uh, so here it's important to make sure that uh, you can't use those nodes to reach the other parts of the network. Of course, if someone would manipulate with a radio base station, uh, you might lose that base station. Maybe it's not a major 
uh, issue. It's only one cell you lose in that case. Uh, so the, the the impact is not as big uh, on, on the radio-based action as if you would be able to reach the core and do something in the core network. Then you could have a major impact on the entire network. So this is just to illustrate that. And uh, by that, I will actually hand over to Irene now. Thanks, Anna. So um, this is actually the um, performance numbers that we got from customer engagement. Um, like uh, this is examples for the some some of the customers their performance requirements for the GI firewall and IPsec um, security gateway. And what we see is essentially across the board, the performance are expected to double every 18 to 24 months, which is uh, really a lot. And, and we see that, uh, and it's not just for GI firewall, IPsec gateway, but also the uh, roaming firewall. And um, another use case that we see requires tremendous performance increase is DDoS protection. Um, some of you that right now listening to this webinar probably still remember several years ago, there's the famous Mirai DDoS attack uh, where the hackers leveraged the IoT devices and launched more than 1.2 1, 1 terabits uh, DDoS attacks and caused several hours of downtime. And what we see is that, unfortunately, that, that would not be the only time with 5G and IoT with the amount of traffic that available for anyone to take advantage, the chances are the DDoS uh, attacks will get even worse. And so when in the time of this and more than ever, the network availability, the, the role of connectivity are so critical, it's very important to make sure the infrastructure security are well equipped to deal with the performance increase requirements. In addition to performance and scale increase, another aspect that um, less people are aware of is the potential threats coming from the architecture evolution and new technology adoption. One of the examples here is about edge computing. Um, and some people call it distributed cloud. Essentially, it's about the evolution of taking the cloud computing technology and bring it to closer to where data is generated and take it closer to the end user. So essentially, the compute getting to the new network edge. And generally, edge computing is acknowledged as one of the key pillars or enabling technologies for meeting the 5G requirements especially for use cases where low latency and bandwidth efficiency are critical. So this is a, a, a trend that we see is gonna happen. And some of the service providers, they already start deploying right now. The edge computing usually complies of multiple diverse technology, including the networking, including computing, including the virtualization layers, and all interoperating in an open ecosystem. So the diversity of that, this kind of open environment opens up actually quite a series of avenues for malicious attacks and privacy issues that could be a threat if there's no security put in place. Um, in this new architecture, since IP connectivity would terminate at the edge, um, if with proper security mechanism, such as encryption, firewall are not in place, then these edge compute nodes are susceptible to get attacks such as spoofing, eavesdropping, and other attacks um, that Anna mentioned earlier uh, coming from the public internet. And another likely model is this edge compute in, would run on the same physical platform like we, uh, as VNF. And so as some of the application could be third-party application and not controlled by the mobile carriers directly, then there are risks that this application may exhaust the, the resources uh, that needed by other critical network functions. And so the, the design and how to separate, um, at least logically, uh, for those applications and the network functions 
this is something that from a design standpoint and security um, micro segmentation needs to be there. But of course, what we talk about, these attack methods are not necessarily new, but as the edge computing environment, the deployment architecture is new. Um, service providers need to plan comprehensively in advance and specifically make sure security is everywhere from day one. So we talk about this virtualization vulnerabilities and this is um, a, a visual representation that I just talked about when there's the shared resources, the third party application and the VNF running on the same shared physical infrastructure. When one of, one of it got infected, it may affect the whole system. And this is the risk that is mature in the cloud data center side, but what we need to make sure is when it comes to the edge compute, the distributed cloud environment, it also have the security mechanism uh, in place. Now, over back to you, Anna. Thank you, Irene. So now we have talked about the threats and uh, the attack vectors, and uh, don't be afraid, we have solutions for, for how to mitigate those. Uh, so uh, there are different things to think about, and as Jeff said, it's not only about 3GPP standard, and this uh, slide tried to illustrate that. Of course, you have we have the 3GPP standard, and it's um, a very good standard to stand on. It's uh, like the basis, you could say. Uh, but in addition to this, we also have to think about other aspects. Uh, first of all, we have to think about what uh, do, how do we develop the products to make sure that uh, we don't have many vulnerabilities in the products. Uh, and uh, besides that, we have to have other security features and function that is not stipulated by 3GPP. In addition, it is about uh, the network deployment and how we make sure that the network in itself is secure and the traffic that is flowing uh, in the network. And then last but not least, uh, the operation as such should also be considered. Uh, how to make sure that the networks are hardened over time, how to make sure that you, uh, the O&M users are using strong passwords, for example, and these type of things. So there are several aspects to think of. If we start with the blue area, the 3GPP area, I will have a, a go through that very shortly, what 3GPP says from a 5G point of view. And then we will go into a little bit about the development part before I hand over to Albert. So, uh, so if we look at 3GPP and what they have defined, uh, of course, 3GPP, they are sort of evolving. Uh, for each new technology, the security items are evolving. So we are inheriting a lot of the security functions we had in 4G. For example, mutual authentication, integrity protection of the control signaling, uh, also encryption of the user and control signaling traffic. This is optional, but uh, here you can see that. So we have uh, uh, protected the air interface, and what is new in 5G, and that is applicable for 5G standalone, is integrity protection of the user plane, which we have not had in 4G before. And then also uh, something new in order to protect against false RBS or string rays. Uh, is concealment of the SIUPI, uh, or the previously called IMSI, so you can't trace uh, users over there. Um, before, we have also had IPsec, and this is not new. I mean, we had this already from 4G, and we really recommend operators to use IPsec in order pr to protect the traffic that goes between the radio base station and the core network. Uh, what is new in 5G besides this is then D DTLS, and that is only applicable for control plane traffic. So you could say it, it could be an alternative or an addition to IPsec. Uh, also what is new is uh, in 5G standalone is protection of application data over the roaming interface. 
there are other things also, but uh, it's so much to cover. These are the main things that are new for 5G. If we look at the development, as I said, it's also important to think about security during the development. And this is just to show an example of what is important to think of. So, for example, in Ericsson, we do like this, that for every release, we always do a risk assessment. So all the new functions we are uh, developing for that re release are going through a risk assessment to see, will this new function introduce a vulnerability? Uh, also, we do a privacy impact analysis. And then we do secure coding, which means that you check that the code is written in a um, good manner, not introducing any new vulnerabilities. And then in the end, before the release, we also do vulnerability testing uh, to make sure that we, if we find something, so we really do test and see if we find something. And then, of course, we have documentation of how to do the hardening. And then we do the drop. And all these activities are important to go through uh, in order to make sure that you have as few vulnerabilities in the nodes as possible. So by that, I will hand over to Albert, who will talk a little bit more on the network level of security. Thank you, Anna. Hi, this is Albert Liu with Juniper Networks. and. An important development in 5G is the usage of artificial intelligence and how can we apply that into improving the security of the network. And one area where artificial intelligence is really helpful is with what we call a security intelligence. So we can take curated information that's curated by hand as well as with machine learning and AI in the cloud and distribute that to infrastructure that's in the network. And by infrastructure, we're talking about firewalls, routers, switches, as well as Wi-Fi. And in order to do that, everything is connected to the cloud and then can receive information about the different types of threats, such as command and control servers, bad GOIPs, and combine this with information that you as the network operator may have custom whitelists and blacklists. When we find information in the network uh, locally, for instance, with firewall, we can share that information, for instance, about infected hosts with other parts of the infrastructure so that you are no longer reliant upon just the detection point in the network for being able to block traffic. You can share that information through the network effect and use that information to stop the attacks at places where you're not necessarily finding the attacks and prevent the spread and blast radius of a threat. Another area where we see a big development for artificial intelligence is with encrypted traffic analysis. So we do know that there is a lot more traffic that is being encrypted, and this makes it very, very challenging to perform high performance analysis of the traffic that's occurring because that would normally mean we would have to be, or some entity has to be a man in the middle to be able to decrypt all this traffic, and that's extremely expensive. So another way to approach this is to think about the beginning of the connection and to look at a large amount of the metadata that is shared as the connection is being started. By collecting this information and bringing it into the cloud and applying behavioral analysis and machine learning, we're able to get visibility and with a high degree of positivity, not having false positives, not having false negatives, be able to identify that there could be encrypted communications that are bad or good and be able to inform the network about this activity. So this is a new trend, we think, for uh, being able to help out with the wide variety of encrypted communications that are occurring from devices, a large number of IoT devices. We cannot necessarily understand that well from the perspective of what types of operating systems they are using. So now we're going to go into a few of the deployment applications for security in 5G and taking a look at the big picture with respect to how we are evolving from 
4G security into 5G. I'll point you out to the left side of the diagram where we are evolving base stations from E node Bs to G node Bs. And in 4G, we had centralized security gateways, which would perform mutual authentication with the base stations and then subsequently encrypt traffic. And in 5G, we are changing this a little bit because now we not only have the centralized security gateways, but they also may live in a place where there is a data center firewall for the service provider. And we also have security gateways that are sitting on the edge cloud because there's not really an easy way to look at that traffic at the edge cloud unless you have a way to de-encrypt it. And then moving over on to the middle of the network, it used to be that the Evolve Packet Core in 4G was built with appliances, custom built, and, and for running the 4G core network. And in 5G, we are seeing that we're going to be taking COTS hardware and using virtualization and containerization technologies to be able to create a native microservices application, which is essentially the 5G core network. And this needs to be micro-segmented so that we can scale different parts of the 5G network independently. And coming out of that 5G network, it looks different than the 4G network. In the 4G network, we had roaming firewalls that would handle the bearer plane to roaming partners. And in the 5G network, we're going to have a combination of two different elements, which I'll talk about in a subsequent slide. Connecting to the internet, uh, in the 4G network, we have GI firewalls. And in the 5G network, we have something similar with the N6 firewalls. But we're going to see those N6 firewalls not only add DDoS protection in, in addition to CGNAT, but also we'll see these N6 firewalls get distributed, as you see slightly over to the left on the bottom of the slide, that in these edge clouds, we'll have virtual N6 firewalls connecting us to uh, the internet and other IP networks. And then going into a little bit more detail about these different applications, the security gateway is evolving from 4G. Its primary role is still to protect that mobile backhaul traffic and to perform mutual authentication of the base stations to the mobile core. And this is absolutely necessary because it's very easy to fake a uh, base station nowadays. And one of the big developments that is happening here is that we are seeing more bandwidth is needed. So whereas in 4G, we would only see about a gigabit or two of traffic from base stations, now we're expecting 10 to 25 gigabits of traffic from base stations, which places a greater load on the security gateway to be able to handle these new fat tunnels. And then we are going to continue to have roaming mainly with uh, the 4G network to start with. But as we go into the 5G core network, this is going to evolve. So the roaming security is going to look quite different. Before, we used to have diameter signaling controllers and roaming firewalls. And in the mobile core network for 5G, there's a new element called the secure edge protection proxy which is going to broker almost all the traffic in a secure fashion over to the roaming partner. Only a few of the elements will be actually available for modification for intermediate roaming partners like IPX and GRX providers. Then on the bearer plane side, there is no longer going to be a GTPC control plane. Instead, we'll see an N4 type of interface informing the IP user plane security function, which you see on the top there, which will then perform the GTPU uh, packet analysis. And it will also be looking for different uh, abuse of those user plane functions or user plane uh, capabilities, just like the roaming firewall currently does, because it will be informed about what users are actually allowed on those roaming interfaces. So we're definitely going to see a different mix here of how these elements, the IP, UPS, and CEP work together. And we also will probably see the evolution of some of these functions, at least the IP user plane security, 
in the home network as well for, for various uses as we see a greater distribution of that N6 interface in the network. And then I'm going to wrap up uh, the part about the existing applications with the GI firewall. So this is going to evolve to the N6 firewall in 5G. And the typical functions here are to perform CG NAT for topology hiding. That way you can't see what's on the other side of the network. So the attackers from the outside can don't really know whom to attack. It used to be that CG NAT was used to do that transition from uh, V6 to public V4 addresses or V4 to V4. And mobile service providers were frankly running out of IP addresses. So you might think, well, now that we're going to IPv6, I have more addresses than I can throw IoT devices at. Why do I need to do NAT? And again, the answer is because you want to perform that topology hiding. We hear of customers that are getting ping sweeped by attackers on the outside. It can happen very, very fast in a volumetric DDoS attack, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But you definitely don't want that to be happening. Uh, CGNAT is absolutely imperative. And then the firewall, of course, is just good hygiene so that you are essentially making sure that only connections or primarily connections that are originated from the inside of the network are the ones that are, you can, are actually you're allowing the responses to come back. So what we're seeing here with this evolution is not only the N6 firewall increasing in capacity and scale, as Irene mentioned, up to a terabit and more, but we're also seeing the distribution of this N6 firewall out to these edge computing sites. Uh, one thing before I go on here is that we'll continue to see a variety of lawful intercept requirements happening here on this firewall because this is just not going away. And the key functions that an N6 firewall will play here are providing enough information to perform the lawful intercept. We're finding that, or we know that the lawful intercept requirements are different in every single country. So there's no one size fits all here. And as Irene had mentioned, we are seeing the growth of terabit uh, scale DDoS attacks. And what is interesting about these attacks is before, you used to be able to stop the attacks quite easily simply by redirecting the traffic for the attacks into a scrubbing center and then having an army of servers essentially go through all your traffic keep the good traffic and cleanse out the bad and then redirect it back into your network. Now the challenge with that for one thing is that it's, uh, it can impact the QoS for your network. So this carefully engineered quality of service you have goes out the window once you do uh, BGP redirect. The other challenge is that we are seeing attacks are very, very large. So scrubbing centers need to be uh, accordingly large in order to handle those attacks. And we're seeing that attacks are very fast. So uh, being able to detect attacks and stop them while they're still ongoing has become more challenging, particularly since it traditionally has taken anywhere from three to 12 minutes to be able to just find the attack, much less stop it. So the new way of looking at these DDoS attacks is to take this malicious traffic, look at it in real time, be able to identify and program in filters into edge routers that have the hardware security capability to be able to stop the attacks in the matter of a few seconds at multi-terabit rate. And then if you can do that, you can not only handle the traffic that's happening in the direction that you are seeing, but also we are hearing a change in the conversations with customers where you, know, you used to not really worry about traffic that was originating from your network. You thought, well, you know, it's just more revenue for us, which is true. But that now has a potential to take down the internal network. It also might be that you might be blacklisted by a provider that you're connected to. So the ability to stop traffic in the opposite direction that we're seeing here is also important. And that's going to be part of how we protect against terabit scale DDoS attacks in the future. 
think we're handing it back to Anna. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you, Albert. So Albert has talked about uh, this uh, network security in that sense, and uh, let's have a little bit look at uh, the security functions we, which we have as part of the 5G nodes. If we start with the G node B, the, the raw node, uh, we, we have thought about this since we, since we started to develop this node, and of course uh, the platform security is very important when we have embedded software and hardware together. Uh, so one of the key things is to protect, first of all, the keys that you use for decryption and encryption, and that you do by having them in a secure storage. And in order to protect it further, you also have to have secure boot and secure the bug. And on top of that, we have signed software, which means that if someone would try to load a software on our nodes, it will be rejected by the node. In addition, we have also thought about node security from start, that it, you should have hardened nodes from start. So we, we for example, we have uh, all the ports that should not be open are not opened. Uh, we only use o secure O&M uh, protocols. Uh, there are no default accounts, there are no root accounts, and also the debug ports are protected. And uh, here you can also see that we have vendor credentials. This is used, for example, to automatically uh, set up an IPsec tunnel towards a Uniper uh, security gateway. Uh, so it serves like an um, identity of the node. And then, of course, we have to protect the logs. So no one should be able to go in and manipulate with the logs. Uh, if we look at the core nodes, um, we have, uh, in addition to what we have had before, uh, we are adding TLS and the TLS between the, in the communication between the different nodes. There are several core nodes, as you can see in this slide here. And then we also have automatic uh, security or certification enrollment using CMP version 2. What is new is the firewall function also towards the interconnecting network. But here it's a challenge, uh, of course, because it's virtualized nodes. We don't have it coupled, hardly coupled to the hardware. Uh, and as Jeff said in the beginning, it's a challenge when we decouple the hardware from the software. And here, the, what, how do we do them with the keys, for example, how to protect the keys that we normally could store in a secure storage somewhere. Uh, here we are looking at uh, secure enclaves. And until we have secure enclaves, we have something called STPM, soft TPM, that we are using. And then also we have a VPN separation, so you can do, separate the different traffic flows uh, within the core network. Um, besides this, uh, it can also be interesting for the operator to think about slicing. Uh, and the good thing with slicing is, of course, that you can then meet the need of different uh, users, you could say. So you could have this, this slide try to illustrate. You might have an industry that have a high demand of uh, low latency, for example. So in that case, we could build an slice that is uh, meeting their requirement. And here I try to illustrate that you could, for example, have uh, IPsec turned on on this interface while the other traffic that is maybe not as sensitive is not using IPsec. But this is uh, just hypothetical. We always recommend to use IPsec. But uh, what is good here is that you have some kind of isolation. So. For certain attacks, if you would have a uh, DDoS attack towards uh, this node, for example, the UPF AMF here in one slice, it will not uh, impact the other node and so on. So the, it provides a certain degree of isolation between the, the slices. By that, I think we should move over to the next chapter, which is the sponsor approach. And uh, I am the first one who will uh, talk about uh, our Ericsson Security Manager. So with the Ericsson Security Manager, we have the capability to uh, detect things that are going on in the network, and that is the idea to do analysis of the different traffic. For example, the capability of detecting a false RBS, uh, 
Uh, in addition to this, we also see a need of keeping track of the configuration of the nodes. Uh, so you can put up a security policy uh, level that the operator would like to maintain for their network and then uh, make sure that all the network nodes are configured with security in mind and then keep track of that over time and monitor it over time. So uh, I would like to end uh, uh, this by saying what we think is important from our point of view. We have gone through the security by design. This is very important. So before we release a product, we should think about that. And we also have inbuilt controls, as we showed here, into the node. Uh, but then we also have the network aspects. And here it's important to think about this from an operator point of view because it's optional. So it's uh, up to the operator to make sure that you here really make use of this and deploy IPsec and deploy the firewalls in order to protect the network. Also here it's important to think about operational aspects. How do you do with your O&M user? How do you make sure that uh, you don't use shared accounts and these type of things and education of the staff? Uh, least, last but not least uh, is, of course, the possibility to uh, monitor the network uh, from a security point of view and detect if something fishy is going on in the network. So by that, I will hand over to Irene. Irene, are you on mute? Oh, yes. Thank you. So thank you, Anna, and thank you, Al Alan. So at Juniper, our approach to 5G security is what we call Juniper Connected Security. Essentially, it's about extending security to all points of connection across the network to safeguard users, applications, and infrastructure that allows customers to be able to see, automate, and protect. Essentially, what we are trying to do is enable customers to be able to build a threat-aware network where the network itself plays a critical role in supporting security with deep network visibility, enforcement on all points of connection throughout the network, at the edge, in the cloud, and every point of connection. So how do we do that? So how we do that is we are bringing security intelligence to the network to set intel, threat profiling, detection of encrypted traffic, DDoS protection, and more. Um, Albert already talked about it earlier. And to achieve the best result, we fundamentally believe that we must take advantage of the existing network infrastructure. It is only really one after you have visibility throughout your network that you can truly see who and what is on your network. And stop those threats requires moving enforcement as close uh, as to the endpoint device and workload as possible. And we talk about the need to strengthen the security at the edge. And particularly, what we see is there are multiple approaches that you can do from both physical and virtual or a combination. So from a virtual standpoint, whether you're using uh, VMs or container deployment up to your preference, what we have is we have the VSIX and CSIX integrated with Juniper Control Edge Cloud. So you have the solution that already well integrated from day zero. And of course, then it makes it easy to have it as you deploy the distributed Edge Cloud to anywhere that you want. From a physical standpoint, what we provide is if you have Juniper MX Edge Routers, a really cool technology that we are committing to and is av already available now is you can easily add on security, leverage the MX Edge platform that you already have, whether it's adding the services card to boost the performance for CGNAT, Staple Firewall, DNS Sinkhole, or um, subscribe to the Set Intel. Uh, that we just talked about, and, and Elba also talked about, and also um, have the 
software with our joint partnership with Corero for the volumetric DDoS protection, anywhere from 100 gig to 40 terabit. And of course, we are also very committed to make sure having a consistent experience between physical and virtual. So now back to you, Jeff. Great, thank you very much. Thanks guys, that was excellent. So I'm gonna wrap up real quick and then we'll get right to Q&A. We have a bunch of questions already, um, but if you uh, haven't submitted your question, uh, feel free to submit questions uh, through the Q&A interface now and we will get through as many as we can. Um, so uh, wrapping up quickly, uh, 5G rollouts are here. Security is more important than ever, and there are security implications for, for all layers of the 5G process, from network design to day-to-day -day operation and for every element across the network uh, that need to be considered. Um, it's becoming increasingly clear that the security needs to be baked in across your infrastructure. There are so many potential points of entry, so many different types of architecture that security needs to be kind of a, a kernel in every, uh, in every location that is a potential point of entry. And comprehensive de deployment at scale is going to require embedding security across your infrastructure and using, purchasing, uh, and deploying dedicated security solutions with the goal in both cases of enabling quick discovery and recovery from attacks. It's going to be a coordinated response between um, elements in the in the wireless and uh, backhaul infrastructure itself, and then uh, a layer of security that sits on top of that. All right. So moving on to Q and A, and like I said, we did have uh, we do have quite a few questions. Don't don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best. Um, okay, first question for Albert: um, What is the significance of Mac security in 5G transport networks? So that's a very interesting question because so much of the transport network is now being equipped with the ability to run MacSec. But I would say that uh, the end-to-end -end security between the base station and the core network is still being run by security gateways, and the, the standards in 3GPP describe using IPsec in order to perform that security. And one of the reasons for that is because with MacSec, you're just talking about an actual way to encrypt information. You haven't really said, how are you going to do the actual authentication? and you also then have to do it hop by hop. So your backhaul will have many hops. It will be complex because you'll now need to perform authentication, mutual authentication on both sides of all those hops. So it could get pretty involved, whereas with security gateways and base stations, they're designed to work together according to the standard. They have been for many years. There's a well-known way of deploying these, and it's end-to-end -end and highly scalable and manageable. For instance, if you find that something's gone wrong with your security gateway, someone broke into it, you can easily revoke the certificate, and then it will no longer be active in the communication, whereas it's much harder to do that if you find something wrong with a node um, that's connected via multiple MACSEC hops. Okay, great. Uh, next question, since it came up twice, I will say that it is uh, something we want to make sure and tackle. Um, I'll pass this one to Anna. And the question is, what security uh, measures need to be taken by the uh, 4G, 5G front hall transport network? Yeah, so the, the front, I, I presume that, that uh, by front hall you mean the CPRI interface, the, the interface exactly. between the base, baseband and the radio unit. Yeah, here we... Uh, we plan for using MacSec. It's a one hop, and uh, in comparison to the other question about using MacSec on the transport, uh, it's much easier when you only have uh, one hop, then you can run um, MacSec, or you could have maybe two hops. But uh, uh, comparing that with having it in the transport, but because the transport is much more complex and uh, much bigger, and you would have to have this uh, support on all the intermediate nodes in the, the backhaul. So we are planning for MacSec uh, for the CPRI interface, both for 4G and 5G. Okay. Um, and then we have... 
a follow-up. I'll throw this out to whoever wants to take it. Um, what about the XN interface? Uh, they need to be encrypted as well. I can take that one. So for the XN interface and the X2 interface between 4G and 5G, uh, we uh, in Ericsson base stations, we support direct IPsec. So you can turn on IPsec directly on that interface. You could also go via the security gateway if you like. It depends on uh, on the, the sort of architecture of uh, the operator's network. But uh, uh, we also have the support for direct IPsec on this interface. Okay. Um, I think the next one I'll kind of throw out to everybody, and maybe we can maybe we can get some different perspectives here. We're asking you to speculate a little bit about which part of the 5G infrastructure, radio access, core network, transport, and I'll even throw devices. Um, do you think will be prone to you know the security attacks? Like if it's an issue of prioritization or figuring out where to focus your energy first. Um, where do you think uh, folks should focus their their energy or where their attacks likely to hit? So, Albert, maybe you can start off. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of like asking us to predict the stock market for the next six months, right? <laughs> we don't really know which part of the infrastructure is going to receive most of the security attacks. But I would say that every single part of the infrastructure is vulnerable in some way if it's deployed in the wrong way or you have an attacker who has enough resources and patience in order to uh, perform their attacks. And I would encourage you to think about uh, what is important to you. In other words, if you're running the network, what are the parts of the network that you can most afford to uh, let go, what are the ones that are the most critical to you, and then perform your investment, kind of spread it out. Don't put all, like the stock market, you don't invest 100% in, you know, Zoom communications because they're the hot ones of the moment, right? You want to spread your eggs across the basket. And similarly, understand and stack rank and prioritize and understand kind of how, what are your, what is your risk overall? And look at how you should address the risk, what's acceptable to you. And I would encourage you to look at the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. It is a technology independent approach and it gives you a way to look at risk, assess your risk, and then decide what to do about it. That's probably the best way to answer that question from a pragmatic standpoint. I agree. Can I, can I comment on that as well? I agree fully yeah, on that. On sure. this. Uh, and I also could say like this, we have seen a trend. I mean, the transport network, uh, previously transport has been really the the part where operators feel that it's not the trusted part of the network. Maybe someone could get into the network. And we have also seen that radio base stations traditionally have been placed in a secure location and considered secure. But this is changing. We see that uh, both the radio base station and the transport network are nowadays becoming a subject for, for attack, you could say, uh, that the operators don't trust them. But then, uh, as you I said, agree. you have to uh, do... Uh, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Oh yeah, I was I was just saying that I, I agree with with, with um, what you just said, Anna. And I think um, to the audience, I think that it's where where is the the part that you you cannot control, right? Traditionally, there are certain parts that you have absolute control, and usually those will be you know considered secure or less prone to attacks or threats. And now uh, the whole trend about being open, there's a lot of good benefit about being open, but once it opens up, then you lose certain level of control, and that also uh, needs to be aware of then what about a security that needs to be, um, you know, put in place, and um, especially when it comes to, like, the, 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 the transport, if you use, like, a third-party transport, um, then, and also if you open up and deploy distributed Edge Cloud and opens that up to third-party application. Those are great uh, potential for business, but at the same time, it's also prone to security threats, and that is why um, security needs to be in place. Yeah, and, and I'll just wrap up by saying, and I, I think another thing that um, service providers are going to have to take seriously and investigate 
especially because of the opportunity to deploy strong enterprise and kind of critical comms services on the back of 5G is what is your relationship with the devices themselves? What, what, um, what is the line of responsibility for making sure you understand the, the security of the devices that are connecting to your network? Um, and I think this is going to be an important in a way that it, it, it hasn't necessarily been important when you were primarily talking about mobile phones. All right, so we have reached the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for joining. Thank everybody who, who is on the line. If we didn't get to your questions, we have your, your information and we can follow up. There are some product-specific questions that we can follow up with you directly on. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Alan to wrap up. Thanks, Jeff. And I, I would also like to thank you for leading our discussion today. And a special thank you to our presenters, Albert and Irene from Juniper and Anna from Ericsson. Uh, thank you very much for this very detailed and engaging discussion today. I want to also thank everyone for participating on the webinar and for submitting all those questions and comments as well. An archived version of this webinar will be made available shortly. In fact, we'll be sending you an email to show you how to access that archive, or you can simply use that same audience link that we sent you earlier. So feel free to come back, view this session again, or even pass it along to your colleagues. A short survey will pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. Please take a few moments to fill that out. And please continue to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for information on future webinars from Omdia brought to you by Informatech. Again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.